evening all seven o'clock and this is happening it's the first one of the new year happy new year it is live and direct on facebook on youtube and that's right on instagram now multifactorial multitasking you name it i am doing the instagram thing now so uh <sighs> that's that i haven't got it. my instagram is live so seven o'clock and it's the first one of the new year i can't believe it people are saying to me happy new year i don't know about you i feel like we're like in the middle of the new year is it really um is that light a bit bright up there turn the light off that's embarrassing did you see i've got a a blanket on <laughs> it's a bit old man isn't it oh, that's embarrassing that is oh god people are here as well jackie's here susie corin's here oh god how are you corin lk's here right good evening all and uh yeah i i bet i i, I guess i should say a happy new year but i don't know about you it feels like it's uh February already but there you go it is indeed the first one of the new year because it is what is it actually the 10th so did I not do it last week then what would last week be the th third would it anyway obviously not um so there you go happy new year uh hope everyone's had a good break uh into the beginning of January bit gray bit rainy sound bands in the house oh no oh Samantha Venner Sorry, I thought you were someone else. Oh, <laughs> Samantha Lena. Um, uh, so, right then. I tell you what, looking at this, looking at myself on camera, I need a haircut, don't I? I mean, some people say that, uh, you know, that I'm, that I'm balding. I know, I know the Rudies. But uh, actually, if you look at how much hair there, I mean, there's a good bit, a good amount of hair there. There's a good, when I always say a good head of hair, because obviously it's, I wouldn't call it a good head of hair, but in that area there, quite a lot. I need to, I've always wanted to just shave it down to skin. I wonder if that'll be less, make you look less bald if you just go like, you know, but I, I don't know, like uh, Raj on Antiques Road Trip. I don't know if you follow that, but um, anyway, that's for another time um jess is in the house i'm very well how are you jessica nice to see you um right i've got some questions if anyone's got any questions then just absolutely chip in oh god nearly nearly blocked your mum of three there sorry about that um here we go i'm going to kick off with this one if it's okay do we offer water jet assisted lab suction i'm kind of assuming everything's working by the way i'm not even going to ask because i think amateurs ask i think you'd have said if it wasn't working oh my god i've got a question on the instagram having stuck the sticker oh that's exciting oh questions from story not question just wanted to say go with jonathan he is amazing 15 months on oh my question is are you wearing a homer simpson hoodie right okay there you go i thought i had some questions there right Okay, but Mum of Three has asked me, it is a homeless insensitivity, and my wife has um, criticised me for saying it's, a, it's um, Christmas. Now, obviously, I did get it for Christmas, but I mean, I mean he's got a Christmas hat on, but it's just weird when you look at it, it's the other way around. But uh, I wouldn't say it's, you know, I mean, you can't just wear these things just for Christmas. I, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, just between you and me, I wear Christmas socks all year round. I mean, there's no way I'm just going to wear that on uh and Christmas but I wouldn't wear a Christmas jumper per se all year round but I think I'll wear this all year round perfectly perfectly good hoodie um anyway right oh we've got another question here quite I, uh good evening what is the recovery time after breast lift and implants good that's a that's a question there right there so um should I do that first before I do the water jet assisted liposuction so find on Facebook and Instagram Corin is the mediator. Um, so a breast lift with implant is a big operation and it's probably the most you can do to an to a breast cosmetically. I'm at, I'm at, I guess 
capsulectomy is sort of quite a lot to do to a breast as well. But um, but certainly breast lifting implants is, is up at the top of, of uh, stuff that you can do to a breast. And uh, the reason for that is that the breast lift makes it all tight. It's got quite a lot of scarring involved with it. And then the implants make it tight again. So it's got a quite a high complication rate. It uh, It feels quite tight and quite uncomfortable to start with. So I wouldn't underestimate it as a procedure. Um, in terms of recovery, uh, recovery times for um, for um, uh, frequent viewers of the show <laughs> will probably realize that recovery times are kind of similar for whatever operation. And what that means is it takes about a week, a week for the skin to heal. And that's whether you're taking a mole off or doing a tummy tuck. Ideally, obviously, if you're doing a tummy tuck or a breast lift with implants, you've got more wounds and you've got more risk of it breaking down but assuming it all goes well it should all be healed the skin should be healed in a week um, so you have dressings on for a week and then we take the dressings off uh, but it does feel weird it does look weird um, and so you have to be prepared for the weird looking nature of it when you first have the dressings removed and uh, I normally say to people the first couple of weeks you're going to feel a bit uh, you know not feel like doing much after two weeks, you should be able to drive. Two to three weeks, two is normal. Two to three weeks, you should be able to drive. And you should be getting back into life and stuff like that. But it might still be, well, it probably will still be a bit uncomfortable and the shape won't be quite right for a few months. So um, gentle, you know, gentle stuff after a couple of weeks. And then usually four to six weeks, if you're doing upper body activities, if your work is manual or if you do the gym, I wouldn't do anything crazy with your upper body for at least a month to six weeks. And... Um, you know, back to work if it's sort of a sedentary job, two to three weeks, if it's a physical job, four to six weeks. And in terms of the sort of um, 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 like um, settling of it, it's a year or so, six to 12 months with the scars to fade, numbness to get better, shape to properly settle. Um, so it is you're looking at a year really for things to really properly settle. And sometimes more, um, but a year will be normal, I would say. Jessica has come in at me with a question. What are the reasons for drains? Are they common after an uplift with implants? Oh, well, there you go. Mum of three. There you go. Mum of three is asking about uplift with implants. And so is Jessica. Uh, so thank you so much. It's something I'm seriously considering. Yeah, go for it, uh, Mum of three. The other thing I would say to you, Mum of three, is that not everyone does it. Uh, a breast lift with implants Pe people stage it and the reason for that is because the high complication rate so you might find some surgeons will not offer it and will only stage it doesn't mean they're bad surgeons well it may, may be they're bad that in itself won't mean they're bad surgeons and it doesn't mean that they're not sort of capable of it a lot of very good surgeons who are capable of it don't do it because it's got a higher complication rate than when you split it when you do either the lift or the implants and then follow up with the other operation for uh, you know four to six months later but um, I do do it, but I always warn people it has got a high. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do do it as a one stage. But I do say it's got a high complication rate. And if one of the things is an overriding thing, like, for instance, if it's a shape and the size isn't too bad, I say, why don't we do the lift and see what it looks like? And then you might not need implants. Or if it's the size and the shape's not too bad, I say, well, why don't we do implants? See what you think. And if the shape's not right, we can always do a lift later. So I do, you know, talk to people about potentially staging it. But if you're like sure that you want a lift and implants, then I do do it as a one op, uh, one one stage. And um, but um, yeah, I warn people to a <coughs> complication rate. Jessica on the old uh, Facebook has asked about drains. So <clears throat> no, well, are they coming after an uplift with implants? I don't know about the world, Jessica, but I don't tend to use implant. Uh, drains after a breast lift with implants as a general rule in in terms of plastic surgery i'm not sure about other surgery but certainly plastic surgery you're moving away from drains we used to use drains a lot more uh, than we used to uh, we used to use drains a lot more than we used to does that does that make sense we used to use drains a lot more full stop i think would be the proper way of saying that um so that than we do now maybe anyway so i think um we are moving away from it i do sometimes use drains uh, in the breast really for a big breast reduction and for a capsulectomy those are the the uh, ops that i would use it so a breast lift with implants i would tend not to so in answer to your question what is the reason for drains well the reason for drains is that when there's a space there the drains will drain that space so they're negative 
pressure, they, they're suction drains, and they they drain the space. So they drain any fluid that might collect in that space, um, which is a good thing, uh, particularly if there's a big space. Now, the thing about a breast lift is that the space isn't that big um, because you sort of close it down. So it's not that big a space. Um, and the downside of a, of, of uh, drains is that there's a root, there's a portal for infection from the outside world to the implant. So if you are going to use a drain, try and use it for like a minimum amount of time. Um, also, they're uncomfortable. Drains are uncomfortable, so pa patients don't like them. Also, sometimes you find the drains can actually irritate the tissues and cause it to, to sort of ooze a bit more, cause it to drain a bit more. Now, one of the big things we used to use, one of, one of the main reasons that I've stopped using them, one of the main reasons that um, uh, that we used to use them was we were worried about hematoma. Hematoma is blood collecting inside it, all ballooning up, and you have to go back to theatre. But um, they've done some quite good studies now where they've done a drain on one side and not on the other side, and they've shown that the presence of a drain will not stop a hematoma. So that is not really a reason to use it. So if you have a, uh, a breast lift with implants and you get a hematoma, and then you have the hematoma washed out, and you might think, oh, there you go, mm, yeah, we should, you know, should have had a drain not necessarily so the presence of a drain will not necessarily stop a hematoma if it's going to bleed to the degree of giving you a hematoma that's going to happen the presence of the drain is not going to stop that so that's no longer a reason for them so the main reason is just to 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 to, to uh, close down the space and as, as i say i don't don't tend to use them for many operations except for the capsulectomy big breast reductions um well that's it really for the breast and then and then tummy tucks in the in the tummy I do use them uh btt chicks what are the incisions placed for a thigh lift can you freestyle it with a picture oh my god <laughs> jessica thank you for that really helped um freestyle it with a picture what do you mean like draw a picture now um so uh let me find something got, got a qr code here so um Basically, uh, I think I can say there's two two main ones. I would say um, so. Okay, that's um, don't worry about the QR code. Uh, that's a that's a shall put something behind it. That's the QR code. That's a thigh. Um, so probably the um, well, actually, I don't know. I don't know what's more common or not. But certainly, the one that people talk about a lot is a thigh lip with an incision in the groin uh, and the incision in the groin will uh oh facebook is really obvious isn't it instagram less so so it's an ellipse in the groin and it pulls the pulls the skin up so it's an upward vector of pull tightening the skin so if you lift tighten the skin in the groin the good thing about that is it gives a scar in the groin crease, um, which is hidden, so you can't really see it. Um, you know, if you're in underwear, you can't really see it, which is fantastic. Um, and you know that that's quite important. Obviously, for any cosmetic surgery, to hide the scar is quite important. So that is a really good thing about that. The other way of doing a medial thigh lift is um, I don't know if I can show this. I don't know if I've shown this very well. Is uh, an incision going down where is it down the all the way down the thigh so this so I'll, i'm going to hash the skin that gets removed so with the with the groin one the skin gets removed up in the groin here with this one with this one um the skin gets removed where is it this one medially and then a dotted line because that's the same on the back so you're taking a lips of skin from the inside of the leg all the way down the inside of the thigh um, and, it, and so this one gives a scar in the groin like that so that's the scar this one gives a scar so this one gives a scar in the groin here this one this one gives a scar all the way down the inside aspect of the thigh so um, I pretty much only do this one I don't do this one it's hard to point it's reversed I don't do this one. I only do this one because I don't like the one with just a little scar in the groin. Don't get me wrong. I like little scars. I think little scars are good. Patients are happy. Cosmetically, that's fantastic and it's great. A couple of problems with it. 
number one problem the groin is hot sweaty area there's a high risk of uh, wound healing problems, wound separation. Um, it can cause issues with it pulling on the genital area. Um, and so there's a lot of potential risks with putting that scar in the groin. Having said all of that, even if you do get wound healing problems, if the wound opens up and takes a long time to heal, if it doesn't leave you, leave you a very nice scar, it kind of doesn't matter quite so much because it is hidden in the groin. So that is a good thing about it. That's not the reason I don't do it. The main reason I don't do it is because I can't get a very good lift with it, basically. Um, I have tried it, I have done it, and it hasn't given, given a very good lift. Um, and if you get someone who needs a thigh lift, uh, what they will often do is they'll pinch the skin side to side and say, look at all this. Whereas the one with the scar in the groin, you're pulling it up. No one ever says, look, pull it up. And when sometimes they like significantly pull it up and say, that'll be all right. And I'm like, no, it doesn't significantly pull it up as hard as you're pulling it up. It just pulls it up a little bit. And so it doesn't give a great lift in my hands. And now I'm saying that because people do it and presumably they, they get happy patients. So it must be a, a, an acceptable thing to do, but it's not something that I particularly have had very good results with. So I find that if I see someone who, if I do a thigh lift, I will do it with a big scar down the medial aspect of the thigh. Now that's a significant undertaking. It's a significant scar. It's not for everybody. It's not a popular procedure. I'll be honest with you. It's only for people with massive weight loss who just find it very hard finding clothes. Because a lot of people say, I hate the look of my thighs. But if I give you a big scar down the inner aspect of your thigh, you might still hate the look of it because I've given you a big scar. So you have to be aware that that scar is quite obvious and you have to be comfortable that that scar is going to be better than the um the um the thing that you've got the um the, the deformity that you've got so uh yeah so those are the, the the two main areas that an incision can be placed personally i only do it with a big scar down the inner aspect of the thigh i don't do it with a scar in the groin um but but that's just me um uh drawing yeah Alison, Alison Lashmar was Etherington. I have, I had gastric sleeve lost around seven stone. Was thirty eight G now a D cup? Some say about breast reduction, but would a lift be better if not wanted to go back bigger as a lot of excess skin? Seven stone was a G now a D. Some say about reduction, but would a lift be better if not wanted to go back bigger as a lot of excess skin? So Alison, um, basically, a yes, a lift. The, the difference between lift and reduction is that the reduction makes them smaller. That's it. They're the same operation otherwise. They're both tightened the skin. They both make the shape better. So if you're happy with a D, so it sounds like you need one, one of them because if you've gone from a 38G to a D cup and lost seven stone weight, well done for that, by the way. Then um, if you're happy with a D cup, then it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a, a lift. If you want to be smaller than a D cup, then it's a reduction. So it's really about personal preference to one extent, the only thing I would say is the bigger your breasts are, the more they'll be acted on by gravity. Cup sizes are notoriously unreliable. So D can be different with different people. But broadly speaking, if you have a reduction and we can take some volume away from the breast, make it a bit less heavy, you're going to get a more long lasting result. Because if you have a lift or a reduction, your body will be acted on by gravity and they will droop again. So they pretty much always droop again. And the bigger they are, the heavier they are, the more quickly they'll droop again. So you will get a longer lasting result if you had a reduction, but you would have to be happy being smaller. If you're not happy being smaller, then just have a lift. Um, you wouldn't go bigger. So you wouldn't go bigger with a, with a lift. You'd be the same size. You don't want smaller. Okay, if you don't want smaller, it's a lift then. That's it. End of. It's not a reduction. Uh, as I say, a reduction, thank you, ETT chicks, a reduction would um, give a long, more long-lasting result. But if you don't want to be smaller, yeah, uh, lift it is. Job done. So uh, what we've got here, what I've got is I uh, – do we offer water jet-assisted liposuction? No, we don't. Um do you know what? There's loads of liposuction, types of liposuction. There's loads of assisted forms of liposuction. The core um, thing is a metal, 
well, usually meth. A rod, a, a, a tube goes in and, and sucks fat out, basically. That's liposuction for you in a nutshell. And the different types of assisting, when we, before we put the, the, the tube in to suck the fat out, um, when they first invented liposuction, they just literally stuck, to, stuck a tube in and started sucking fat out, and they found that it bled a lot. Um, it's quite a traumatic procedure, and there's a lot of bleeding. Therefore, to reduce the bleeding, we now inject fluid. We inject quite a lot of fluid into the area to liposuck before we liposuck. So that's the way we do liposuction. You inject quite a lot of fluid, and then you, 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 everything swells up. And then when you suck the, the fat and the fluid out, it bleeds a lot less. Um, now, water jet assisted liposuction is a procedure where instead of having to inject a load of fluid and then, you know, and then suck it all out, it injects the fluid at the same time as sucking it out. So it's just a bit more efficient. I don't, I don't use it, and I don't simply because I don't work at a hospital with it. To be honest with you, even though I did work at a hospital with it, I probably wouldn't use it unless. Anyway, I don't. I mean, I think it probably. I mean, I know people who have used it and think it's good. So it is good, and apparently it's a lot more efficient and a lot quicker because you can, in, you know, inject the fluid at the same time as sucking it out. So, um, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't do a huge amount of liposuction. I really do it when I do the life when I do the hips. Uh, the hips of a tummy tuck. I'm not one of these people who do sort of whole body liposuctions and some people make their whole practice on liposuction. So I don't I don't do huge large volume liposuction. So that's why I say if I if the hospital had it I probably wouldn't use it just simply because I you know you get comfortable with what you're comfortable with and um and I'm comfortable with you know the power assisted liposuction or just suction assisted liposuction. Um, but I think it's good, as I say. It's been to be reused. It say that it's good. I think it's good. And I also don't work in a hospital. You've got the machine, so even if I did use it, I couldn't use it because I'm an hospital. Anyone could say it's kind of better than another type of liposuction in terms of the results. I don't think you can tell the difference what type of liposuction someone's had based on a clinical result. Um, and I think it's just more of a an efficiency from the surgeon. Although I guess it's probably best. I should say you should speak to someone who does it. If, if they have got some convincing benefit of it, um, because I might be a, a um, sort of vested interest, what's the word, like um, skewed opinion, because I don't do it. There is a word, which will probably come to me at some point. But um, uh, Booked in with you next week. There you go, Alison. Well, we've just done a consultation there. You need a, a lift. We've we ascertained that. Look at that. There we go. Katie Sarah's joined. Um, what we got? Advice on taking supplements following surgery. What do you think about taking supplements such as bromelain and arnica after surgery? I haven't got a strong view about this. I um, I know that a lot of people say arnica is really good for uh, bruising. And um, I know some surgeons will advise stuff. I know some surgeons will advise against some stuff because there's um, some things that can, which can cause bleeding. I don't advise for or against anything. I haven't got a strong view about you taking um, supplements or not taking supplements. I have to be honest, bruising is not normally, normally a feature. Having said that, for things like liposuction, it can be a feature. And sometimes you do an operation, do a breast augmentation or something where you don't normally get much bruising and you get, you know, you get quite a bit of bruising. You think, oh, crikey, you don't normally get bruising. It doesn't help that person with the bruising. Um, so I don't think there's any harm in taking things like Arnica. And as I say, some people say that it is good for uh, bruising. So go for it um, if, if you think it's good. But I don't. I don't know of any sort of evidence. I don't know if they've done sort of studies and trials on certainly the sort of ops that I do. I think maybe on ops which are a model, like it's, as I say, extensive liposuction or something like that, maybe it'll have more of a benefit. But um, I'm not a, a a great advocate of, you know, encouraging certain supplements and what have you. In terms of vitamins and things like that, I normally say, look, good, good diet, fresh fruit and veg, drink plenty of water, that sort of thing. Which is, you know, I think that I think most of your vitamins and what have you will come, will come in in that. When is the best time to get a post-op to bra? When it, 
should you wait until some swelling has gone down after a few weeks? Are sports bras any good? Yes. So I used to say to patients, um, bring a bra with you at the time of doing surgery. But that was always a bit unsatisfactory because they would say what size and I would always say don't know, bring a range. And it was always a bit not very good. So uh, what I do now is I give you a bra when you have your surgery. And um, so you don't have to worry about a bra when you have surgery because when you often, you know, before the surgery, you're not sure what sort of size you're going to be. So once you have, so you don't have to worry in the, in the immediate post optic period. Um, now, the bras that we use have got a bit of give in them. You really want a, a, a post optic bra to have some give in it. So sports bras are really good. And some of the things you're looking for are it's quite nice if it has got adjustability within it. So if it has got different sets of hooks and eyes and ideally if it's got the uh, fastening at the front, if it's got the hooks and eyes at the front, that's ideal. Um, but it is quite hard to find them with the fastening at the front. So it might be the fastening at the back. But but uh, hooks and eyes is, is better than, for instance, a zip. Some of them have a zip at the front, particularly the sports bras, which don't have that adjustability in it if it's a zip. Um, so what you really want is one that basically has got no structure when it's not on. So when it's not on, it wants to be flat, flat on the table. If it's got a cup, kind of when it's on a table, it's not going to give you support. So when it's flat on the table, then that means it will sort of adjust and mold to the size and the shape of your breasts. And so those ones tend to be a bit more like small, medium, large, as opposed to 34B and C, you know, cup sizes, because you really want ones that aren't so specific with a cup size because you're absolutely right, it can swell. Um, so it's a difficult question to answer because I kind of understand you saying, should I wait a few weeks before buying a post-op bra because of the swelling? But it's like you need the post-op bra because of the swelling. So if you wait until the swelling's gone down, you kind of don't need a post-op bra anymore. So I would say to you, I wouldn't necessarily wait for the swelling to go down. But if you get one with adjustability in it, so particularly with the different sets of hooks and eyes, or even the ones with the zip, the sports bras with the zip, as I say, they've got a bit of a jump. They haven't got a set cup, so they've got a bit of adjustability within it. It can accommodate that swelling. And so I would say don't necessarily wait for the swelling to go down. I think the first few weeks is probably the worst time for the swelling, the first month or so, really. Um, so you need to be thinking about around then. Uh, we give you one immediately so you get an idea broadly what size you are. But uh, hopefully if you can get one with a bit of flexibility in it, then that will be um, beneficial uh, because there will be swelling and the size will change. You can't be too specific about the size in the first probably couple of months. I normally say about three months you're getting an idea. So certainly the shape's going to settle in that first three months and the size will set a little bit. There'll be swelling, you know, not dramatic, but there can be quite a bit of swelling early on. But if you can get a bra that accommodates that and can take the swelling because it's got a bit of sort of giving it, then that's the that's the way to go. So are sports bras any good? Yes, sports bras are good. Um, so that you know, I you know we use post op bras simply because it you know we're sort of surgical place. But uh, I think when people make post op bras, they put a you know they make it more expensive than a than a um, sports bra. So you know, and they're similar to be honest with you. So I think you can get some really good supportive sports bras which can do the job. Um, and if you want, you can always bring it in with us and Vicky can have a look at it and things like that if you're wondering about bras and what have you. Alison, what you got? Is there a time limit you can't drive after fleur de -lis and breast lift? So fleur de -lis, you're talking big deals here, Alison. fleur de -lis is a big deal. So um, it's the fleur de -lis that's going to knock you back. Uh, so fleur de -lis is an abdominoplasty, for those who don't know. It's a type of tummy tuck. It's a bigger than a, a normal, like a, what we call a full tummy tuck in that there's a horizontal um, uh, component which is standard but then there's a vertical component as well so you get like a, a, a t-shaped scar um, so um, first of all uh, Alison check with your insurance company the car insurance might say you've got to be you know a month after surgery or whatever like that if if that's the case you better do whatever they say if they say it's up to the surgeon I would say to you um, that's a big op a fleur de -lis and a breast lift three weeks and then see how you go. Obviously, you've got to wear a seatbelt. Well, even you've got to wear a seatbelt going home from the hospital. Um, and you've got to be able to do an emergency stop and what have you. So three weeks, I would say, is is kind of where you're looking at in terms of driving after that kind of op. Might be longer because you might have healing problems with the breast lift or the fleur de -lis, And you might 
you know not feel up to it so you know three weeks three weeks would be sort of average but but it's uh depends on how you how it goes how, how you get on do you offer medical spa or fat freezing no we don't i wish we did in a way because i love the thought of having something to offer patients that they come back for and they you know we can have a chat with them because I've, I've been through this with the people that sell these machines and you know it, it's a really nice idea that you come and you have a chat with patients it takes a long time to have the procedure and they have a cup of tea and you have a rapport and you really build community which is something that i really want to do at the clinic and and it's something we can offer to patients who've had our surgery and stuff like that so it really does sit well with the clinic um but i haven't i haven't been could i say oh, well i haven't been that impressed with the results i suppose i'm going to say it i haven't been that impressed with the results I've, uh, we tried some machines um i've been to meetings they show photographs doesn't matter where you go they always show these stock photographs from america saying look at this fantastic result i'm like if it's that good they should be showing photos of your own results you know and i think it's one of those ones where you kind of have to convince patients it's it's worked and uh, you know i see a lot of patients who hasn't worked fantastically well maybe you could say well i'm seeing a self-selected group of patients because the one that has worked fantastically well with i don't see so i, I accept that that might be a um a valid a valid point but um the main problem with it is as i say i think the results can be subtle and it's expensive you know the machines are expensive the consumers are expensive so you have to charge a lot of money for it so i think if you're charging a lot of money for a subtle result i worry that that's going to lead to disgruntled patients so i haven't embraced it although i love the thought of it and i would love you know wouldn't it be great if we just do that all day long and wouldn't have to do surgery and make cuts and stick things into people absolutely great you know i would love it you know complications less brilliant happy days but uh i i, I don't think it's yet maybe I'm, I'm probably one day it will be there and they'll say what you used to stick a thing in and suck the fat out oh my god that's so prehistoric nowadays we just put this machine or take this tablet and it will go you know there'll probably be something in the future where it'll all just disappear by some kind of external means but for me i haven't found one that um that that gives Good enough results basically do you offer lasering or injections to improve the look of my breasts no i wouldn't even know where to start with that are there are there such a thing are there laserings and injections you can do to improve the look of breasts i don't know no, I don't, well the answer is no don't and i don't even know that didn't know that there was any lasering or injections that can be done for breasts um i didn't know it was such a thing so um if it is such a thing let me know and i'll try and respond but i don't know of any laser that's going to do anything to improve the look of your breast or inject there used to be an injection to um make the breast bigger um macrolane it was called it was like a filler for the breast but that was taken off the market because there was some problems with imaging it was maybe getting a bit confused for, uh, for breast cancers so they took that off the market um but um but um but they took that off the market so that they don't have one anymore so i don't know where's the question gone the question's gone i don't know of any in injections or laserings to improve the breast shape yeah um does the nipple always need to be moved during a breast lift you know it's one of those questions where you think you start to question yourself um because initially it's like you know when you see the answers on who wants to be a millionaire and one of them you initially have a response to and then you think oh god this is for this is for sixty four thousand pounds i better maybe maybe it is another one of the answers because my initial reaction is obviously yes but now I'm thinking, why are they asking the question? Is there someone who does a breast lift without moving the nipple? Um, I mean, I guess there are only the only situation where that could potentially be this case is something called pseudotosis. And pseudotosis is something usually when someone 
has uh, had a breast reduction and their breasts have drooped again, but if their nipples were put a bit high initially, they've got too much below the, 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 uh, the, the nipple and they've got what looks like a droopy breast, but if you measure the nipple and you look at the position of the nipple, it's actually sitting in a good place, but the global shape of the breast is droopy and it's actually quite an unusual, odd looking breast. Um, and that would be a surgical complication. It would be unusual to be have a natural breast that shape. Um, so I guess you might not move the breast in that situation. You just tighten the, the skin below the breast. But in someone who hadn't already had surgery, I would say, yes, a breast lift involves moving the nipple, um, whatever. Um, yes. So that's my final answer. Yes, the nipple always needs to be moved during a breast lift. Yes. Uh, Alison, what you got? Is there a price list for breast lift? I have price reduction. Yes, there is, Alison. Um, I, I'm assuming your name like is similar to what that is in real life. If you can, I'll tell you what, if you can private message or something, just say what's the price for breast lift, because Amy will have the price for breast lift. She can email you. We must have your email if you've got price reduction. Uh, and it's less, you'll be pleased to hear. So a breast lift is less than a reduction. A reduction is a bigger operation more risks to associated with it um, and um, and more and you have to send the tissue for histology as well so um, yeah breast lift is cheaper would you offer a vision surgery following a fleur de lis tummy tuck would you offer vision surgery following scarring is awful and I have lost faith in my surgeon um never say never is what I'll say to that never say never um but again, my initial answer is never. <laughs> Although I've said never say never, but I'll just say that. You know, my initial answer is I tend not to. Uh, if someone has a problem with surgery, I always say go with the original surgeon. Most surgeons are trying to do their best. Totally understand it when you're saying you lost faith with your surgeon, but they are trying to do their best. We can all get complications, we can all get problems. And your surgeon has a vested interest to to make things right for you. The problem with going to a different surgeon is twofold. First of all, that surgeon has not got a vested interest. And so that surgeon will charge you and will kind of charge you full price for having whatever revision you need. And actually, the surgery to do revision uh, on people is often, I mean, I don't know what the, uh, you know, if it's just a little bit of a not very good scar, that might not be major surgery, but it's often quite major surgery. And it's often like worse than doing the surgery first time. So it's often more expensive than doing it first time. And, you know, that can create a bit of tension there. If you clearly you've already paid a lot of money to have your surgery done at the, you know, wherever you've had it done. And it, and it can create a bit of tension when you start sort of asking for money, you know, to fix revisions and, and what have you. Um, because they're generally speaking more difficult, more because you're dealing with scar tissue, more risk of complications of it not being right. You know, revising a scar, is, we're going to create more scar tissue. We've got to say, how can we make that scar better? So we're trying to make that scar better. It may never be as good as it would have, you know, a, a sort of first time scar. And so that's difficult because if you're paying twice and you end up with a scar that's worse than your friend who just paid once and has got a great scar and you're like, not only did I pay my first surgeon, I paid this other guy who's supposed to be an expert. And look at it, it's still not very good. You know, that's not a good place to be because, um, you know, it's uh, it's hard to say, look, you, you got scar tissue there and we're fighting with scar tissue. You, you didn't have scar tissue pre-op, you know, and, and, and we're, we're working with that. So that's my take on revision. My take on revision is it's a tricky area and I always encourage people to go back and see their original surgeon because there's a lot to be said for sticking with your original surgeon or maybe with your original surgeon's blessing, looking at other opinions, you know, with with under their auspices, because they might facilitate that and help out with um, costs and things like that. If it's done under the umbrella of your surgeon, maybe not specifically by your surgeon. Uh, so that's where I would be going for on that one. <clears throat> Zena, I am currently uh, A cup and petite. 
I would love implants, but would like a natural look. Is this something to you with having such tiny body frame? Absolutely, Zena. Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, knee jerk answer is definitely yes for sure. The only thing I would say is you've got to be careful. So if you are an A cup and petite, you've got to be careful um, because it is easy to make it look unnatural. Um, someone with quite a big breast and a lot of breast tissue, it's actually quite hard to make it un unnatural. So it's, it's difficult if they say, I want the fake look and they've got quite big breasts because even if you put a big extra high profile implant in, the, the normal breast on top of that implant can soften the look. If you haven't got much breast tissue, uh, and if you're very slim, then you've got to be much more focused on the shape and the profile of the implant. So you've got to really focus on that. You've got to get the width right. You've got to get the profile right, the shape right. So this sort of person, I'm not saying for sure with you, but the, the, you're the sort of person I'd be thinking more along the teardrop lines compared to, as opposed to the um, round and and, uh, and and sort of lower profile. So you've got low, moderate, high, extra high profiles. You're going for lower pro profiles, uh, and, and basically less fullness in the upper pole. Uh, and so I'd probably be thinking about along the lines of, of, uh, of a teardrop implant. But it's, it's absolutely possible to have a, a natural looking breast uh, if you are uh, petite. It just means a smaller, narrower, less full um, implant, just bringing the frame into balance. And um, I'll have to check on my website if you want photos of that sort of thing because that's sort of you know you need to look for photos and, and I'm sure you'll find photos of people who've got um, great natural results with that sort of frame. It's actually quite a good frame and a, and, a, and a nice sort of frame to operate on. Um, so yeah, I think it should it absolutely be possible for sure. But just be careful in terms of the volume and the, and the shape. Uh, don't, don't listen to people if it, if it comes out. I mean, I know sometimes it comes out like quite a small volume, like 150 cc's or something. Um, and your friends will be like, what, 150 cc's? No, you've got a bigger, you know, there's no point in having it done and all this. Don't listen to them because you've got to get the, don't worry about the size, Measure, worry about the measurements of it. You know, if you if your friends say, oh, you've got to have at least 250 and then you get this round implant, you get this dome shaped breast, it doesn't look right. So focus on the, the shape and don't focus on the size is my my advice to you on that one. Um, Alison, you're welcome. Sarah, is there any surgery similar to a tummy tuck for men, but to create muscles from a previous surgery and scar and a pot belly? The previous surgery wasn't plastics and was for a duodenal rupture and scar goes from the pubic area to the chest. From the pubic area to the chest. Um, answer to your question, Sarah, for sure there is. There's a tummy tuck for men, basically. Um, you know, bodies are bodies and, and men have tummy tucks just like women have tummy tucks. Not as common because they don't have pregnancy basically because that's a large reason for needing a tummy tuck having pregnancy but if but for sure weight loss people need um need a tummy tuck um it, it sounds complicated what you're describing here and i'm trying to think where the scar goes so the scar goes from the pubic area up so my i guess my main question would be does it go above the belly button or not so if it's what's called a lower midline scar which is from the belly button down then if they've got enough laxity in their skin they could have a full tummy tuck which would remove that scar and tighten the skin um and um and correct the muscles so that would solve everything if the scar goes keeps on going above the belly button so if it's a proper midline incision all the way up to the sort of rib cage that's a little bit more oh it's around the belly button okay makes it a bit more difficult because it's going to be a problem with wound healing and it would dep depend on how much laxity is in the skin. So it's a difficult one, Sarah. Really one need to assess. So you kind of would need laxity. So a little bit, a pot belly is not really enough. You need to have have lost weight, really, because if you just got a bit of a pot belly, then everything's going to be a bit tight. But if you have been bigger and then smaller, then you've got some laxity to play with so that we need laxity in order to tighten the skin down and get rid of some of that scar. So... Um, yeah, okay, the husband who is skinny and doesn't actually need a tummy tuck in a traditional sense. Well, then that's difficult, Sarah. It's difficult because, first of all, it the surgery would probably be looking at maybe for create uh, fixing the muscles rather than the um, correcting the scar because we can't remove a significant amount of that scar uh, if, if your husband hasn't got a significant... Um, 
laxity there so that that scar probably wouldn't be removed the difficult it's it's difficult and i and i've struggled with this in the past in in men who have got weakness in their muscles who haven't got enough for a tummy tuck and you end up doing something like a mini tummy tuck which is just taking a little bit of tissue below the belly button if they haven't got enough uh, laxity to get the tissue from above the belly button down to the pubic area if their skin isn't lax enough for a full tummy tuck then you can't you it's hard to access the muscles when you talk about repairing muscles it's usually the the rectus abdominis muscles which are splayed apart and they, they you have to go above the belly button for that and when you do a mini tummy tuck you don't do anything to the belly button and because the belly button's on a stalk it's in the way so you can't get above there to to correct the rectus abdominis muscles so um you i guess you've got two options one is you can float float the belly button which means you cut the stalk of the belly button and then you get up there or two if he's already got a uh, a, a midline scar is you use the midline scar to access and repair the muscles um and, and it's probably sorry this is sort of dwelling into the realms of the general surgeon so it's it's probably a general surgeon who's done this kind of surgery so it's probably a general surgeon who might be the person to fix these problems because like when you're saying um problem with them with the um, muscles i'm thinking has he got a hernia you know if you're saying he's got uh, to correct the muscles has he actually got a hernia has he got an incisional hernia um, and then, again that's a different kind of thing than repairing the muscles we do for women who've had pre pregnancies because their skin their, their muscles have been stretched but if you've actually had surgery and they've actually gone into your abdomen then i'm thinking actually could the you know presumably he's got a bulge there that's why you're saying he's a muscle crease could the bulge be actually due to a defect in the abdominal wall as opposed to just some laxity because when there's laxity, we just bring it together. Um, but when there's a hole in the abdominal wall, we might not be able to bring it together. We You might have to look at repairing the hernia, which then gets into meshes and difficulties. And, you know, the general surgeons are more expert in abdominal wall reconstruction uh, than, well, certainly than I would be. Um, so, you know, is it is it a bigger problem is what I'm thinking. Is it an abdominal wall problem? and less of a skin and soft tissue problem. Even if the skin and the soft tissues are a problem, I'm not sure how much we could do for it you know, in terms of the scar, simply because it sounds like he hasn't got a huge amount of laxity. So he's not really in the realms of tummy tuck. So it's a very interesting problem, Sarah, a difficult problem. Um, he wasn't put together properly, yeah. It's a difficult problem, Sarah. Um, and just from what you're saying, so it's no, obviously not the same as a consultation, but I'm kind of, thinking whether a general surgeon would be the way to go. I don't know. Um, but uh, so the initial answer to your question is, yes, men can have a tummy tuck, but I'm not sure if your husband's a candidate if he's um, quite skinny. So uh, you need to, you need to have that, that laxity in, or, in order to do a tummy tuck. And if he hasn't got the laxity and he's just got bulges, it's a different op and a different problem. And interesting, though, it's a good one um do we offer dermabrasion for tattoo removal no we don't um i mean dermabrasion is for sure a thing um it's dermabrasion basically is kind of like sandpapering your skin basically taking the top layer of the skin and it's good for uh resurfacing fine lines and wrinkles and things like that um but it only really takes off the top layer of the skin and tattoos tend to be a little bit deeper into the skin so i'm not sure to be honest with you uh how good dermabrasion would be for a tattoo removal because i'm not sure if it would remove I, you know i'm not sure if it would remove enough skin to to get rid of the tattoo of the tattoos you the ink is usually through the full thickness of the skin and therefore it would need the full thickness of the skin to be removed and therefore um, dermabrasion wouldn't be appropriate because you just get a big open wound so the answer is we don't do it so again don't take my word for it talk to someone who does do it because that might be a better um a, a more balanced opinion but i don't think just from just thinking about it i don't think dermabrasion would be a, a good option laser on the other hand would be a good option because laser can target the ink and uh, that's a little bit different so that can spare the skin but any sort of ablative thing that you're just going to you know destroy the skin you don't care whether it's got ink on it or not you're going to have to destroy the full thickness of the skin to get rid of the tattoo and and then you're going to be left with a wound <clears throat> and uh which isn't going to be pretty is it let's face it um 
Is it normal to have more than one lipoma appear in the same area? Bracket scalp. Um, is it normal? Well, it's not abnormal. Lipomas are common and you can get multiple. You can get loads. You can get one, can get two. Is it normal? Yeah, I'll just say yeah. Yeah, it's normal. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's normal. I mean, it's not like worrying or anything. Uh, I mean, it's unlucky, I guess, but worse things can happen than having a lipoma. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, having said that, if you've got a lipoma in your skull, I don't think you should go looking for another one. I don't think it's that normal, it's only sort of usual, but if you have two lipomas in a certain area, it's like, oh, right, you've got two lipomas. It's not like, oh, wow, that's abnormal. So I guess in that case, it's normal. Okay, um, do we offer face rejuvenation at our clinic? No, we don't. We've been round and round with this, and um, in terms of, you know, in my, in my mind and in the planning of the clinic as to whether we do that sort of stuff, because, again, I love the concept of it, because I love the concept of people coming back for to see us, you know, like the hairdresser type thing, you know, having a relationship, if you like, with patients. Um, and that's something I've always wanted, and it's difficult because of the sort of work I do, breast reductions, tummy tucks. It kind of tends to be one-off procedure that people don't really come back. So I'd love, love to have a reason for people to come back. So, you know, face rejuvenation, presumably talking things like, you know, um, the Botox, muscle relaxant injections and fillers and resurfacing and all these sorts of things. Um, the fact of the matter is I don't do cosmetic facial surgery. So I don't do facelifts, rhinoplasties, blepharoplasties, brow lifts, you know, nose jobs, um, neck lifts, all these sorts of things. I don't do it. Um, and I, for me, it sort of lends itself to the facial rejuvenation. I know there's loads of places that do facial rejuvenation and don't do surgery as well. But I kind of feel that because I'm a plastic surgeon, that's the focus of my clinic, the breast and the body. Um, so we don't. As of aujourd'hui, maybe one day we'll get into that and we'll be a bit more like a business and do that sort of stuff. But at the moment, we're very much focusing on breast and body uh, surgery because that's what I do. That's what I know. If you've got any problems, if you've got any questions like this, hit me. If you've got questions about facial rejuvenation, I'm not really a man. I don't do that day in, day out. I haven't really got the, the knowledge and the nuances of it. You know, I know broadly speaking about it obviously but i'm not doing it on a daily basis so i haven't got that kind of um experience that i can that i can give you in the same way that i can talk to you about breasts and bodies and tummies and stuff like that and on a final note you'll be pleased to hear um can you offer upper and lower breath pass at the same time again i don't do i think pretty sure uh Costas does he so does does uh, upper blepharoplasty maybe lower as well um uh so blepharoplasty is is eyelid uh so upper and uh, lower lower bags and upper upper excess skin um yes you can for sure you can uh again we do, it's not really our forte uh we do we would do upper blepharoplasty in the in the clinic so as i say upper blepharoplasty is relatively easy lower blepharoplasty is a little bit more of a challenge and often needs either a general anesthetic or a local with sedation, uh, but it can be quite re rejuvenative, it can rejuvenate the cheek and uh, improve the um, um, the sort of tired look you can get with excess skin in your lower uh, eyelid. But you can for sure have them at the same time, although it does make it, as I say, a little bit more difficult because it's, it's uh, an upper's done under local anesthetic, which is a simpler procedure, but they can be done at the same time, but not by me, because I don't, uh, do you know what? I don't do it and I've got no wish to start doing it to be perfectly frank with you I um yeah I've got enough on with with you know all the breasty and all that stuff and I don't really want to don't want to do it I want to do you know what I enjoy doing basically so I'm not saying I wouldn't enjoy it. well I wouldn't enjoy doing them but we're well, certainly a lower left party because I'd be lost an upper left for party probably wouldn't enjoy it because it, you just don't enjoy stuff you don't know what you're doing when, you know doing surgery when you're not sure of yourself this is i mean a lot of people do a quite a wide range um i've narrowed down my range quite a while ago 
So I just stick, stick, stay my lane, as they say, stay in my lane. On that note, thank you. That was a good one. But that was a first. Do you know what? I feel like we should have held some of those questions back for next week because I feel like we're going to have nada next week because we've had, we've had Sarah, we've had Zena. We've had all sorts joining in. Here we had, we've had Mama Three, we've had Alison. So we've had a lot of interaction today, which um, stars, you mean to go on. God, if I, you know, keep it up, people. Thank you for that. Um, I, oh, look at you, Corinne's still here. Uh, hope you're all right, Corinne. Hope you're relaxing and putting your feet up. Um, and uh, yeah, I just hope we haven't got any. <laughs> no, we have, we've got some for next week. If not, I'll just talk about some of the ones. I did today again just bring it up no one noticed anyway back on track next week presumably i'm here i can't always say that as if i've got some kind of jet set lifestyle that i might be doing something else next week let's be honest with ourselves i've got nothing in the diary for 2023 i'll be honest with you there is nothing in that diary okay so i'm gonna be here next week um jackie's here jackie look at that staunch supporter um i will yeah so let's face it i'll be here next week then so see you next Tuesday, same time, same place. Have a fantastic week. Hope the rain stops. And uh, feet up watching the Newcastle game. Awesome. And Salma Fruits just joined. Good on you, Salma. Listen, watch the replay because it was, you know, mind-boggling. Some of the stuff I spoke about was uh, groundbreaking. Anyway, um, see you next week. Hasta la vista. And now, oh, share. Oh, hold on. Facebook's still on. Hiya, Facebook. See you next week. And thank you for being very, very uh, interactive today. Uh, it hasn't gone unnoticed. Uh, oh, Sarah says thanks. Oh, no. So, yeah, good. I've done all those comments. Yeah, see you this time next week. Stop the stream.